Have you ever looked deep into the ocean while at the beach asking yourself, what is out there in our deepest, darkest oceans? That's a question I've been asking myself my entire life. I'm an oceanographer who lives by the shores of Rhode Island. I've had a passion for the ocean ever since I was little. Whenever I went to the beach growing up, I would swim as deep into the ocean as I could, having the desire to explore and see what is out there. But my father or a lifeguard would stop me every time. But it didn't stop me from having a fascination with the ocean. My parents took me to aquariums, and I would spend hours gazing into the various tanks of sharks and other sea animals. My fascination for the sea animals was just overwhelming as a kid. Back in the day, I knew kids who were obsessed with cars, dinosaurs, sports, or even religion. However, I always felt like I was the only one of my age who had a sheer fascination with the entire ocean, and I couldn't figure out why. When I was 10, I got my first snorkeling set in flippers, and when I was a teenager, I took scuba diving lessons. I thought of doing marine biology in college, but I was not just interested in the sea animals. I wanted to learn as much as I could about the entire ocean itself. Along with fascination with the ocean, I was afraid of it. For centuries, there were legends of terrifying sea monsters attacking ships. I took them with a grain of salt, but then I learned about a ship called the USS Stein. It was a destroyer from the 1970s that was on patrol, and then it was forced to return to a port in San Diego after suffering the failure of its sonar system. Upon investigation, it was revealed that serious damage was done to the sonar dome on the ship, with cuts of four foot across the protective rubber coating. Embedded in those cuts were the remains of sharp, curved claws associated with giant squid attacks, but claws left on the ship were from an animal larger than any previously discovered squid. Many believe that the animal must have been 150 feet long, significantly larger than the giant or colossal squid. To this day, that story unnerves me. For the past few months, there have been numerous reports of large ships gone missing on the east coast, including a few naval ships. The Coast Guard did investigations and found them at the bottom of the ocean. The exact cause of them to sink has been unknown. Combine that with the creepy true story of the USS Stein, I found myself having nightmares of being on a ship during a stormy night getting attacked by a monster squid. The fear I have causes me to have more respect for the ocean, as I have a constant curiosity with what lurks beneath the waves. While I was in my house one evening, a coworker of mine named Michael called me on the phone. Hey, how you been? He asked. Hey Michael, I've been doing alright. I can't stop thinking about those ships that have been sinking on the east coast. I replied. So have I. Our boss recently ordered a submersible called the Ziyang. I'm calling you to let you know that we have just been assigned to go out into the ocean with this submersible to investigate the wreckage of the sunken ships. Suddenly, I began to feel nervous. I'm not sure if I'm prepared to find out what's down there, I said. Really, we're on the same boat, pal, literally, said Michael. Who knows what we might find. Maybe we'll find Clover from Cloverfield. I love that film. It ended in a cliffhanger and I really wish we could get a proper sequel. You know what I mean. Yeah, it was alright. But I'm honestly nervous of what we might find. I said. We're gonna find sucking chips, dummy. He laughed. So, here's the plan. Meet me at the docks at 6 in the morning. There will be a research boat with several crew members operating the boat. And of course, we will be operating the Xeon. We will go to the coordinates where the last missing ship was seen and investigate at the bottom of the ocean. Suddenly, I felt a sense of adventure like when I was at the beach as a kid. Sounds like a plan. I'll see you there, I said. I then hung up the phone and got myself ready for the next day. The next morning, I arrived at the dock at exactly 6am. 
There is a small research vessel with a submersible at the back. Michael waved at me. Ahoy, welcome aboard. As we got on the boat, I walked towards the Xiang to get a good look at the submersible. It had the typical fishbowl looking front with two seats inside, but it had massive arms with five fingered hands and had two long arms in the front of the vehicle with claws. I noticed a logo on the sides that read, Black Mercury. Michael went up to me. What do you think? He asked. I turned my head towards him. It's a little bit unusual with those humanoid arms. Michael looked at the Xiong. Yeah, some organization called Black Mercury designed this experimental submersible. They study and investigate reported anomalies from around the world. They often make their own equipment for investigations. With the Xiong, we are supposed to report our findings to our boss and then that information will be sent to Black Mercury. Some of the ship's crew started the boat and we headed off to sea. We got a box of donuts inside. You want some? Michael asked. Uh, thanks for the offer, but I already had breakfast, I replied. I stayed in the back of the boat, watching mainland slowly shrink as we went further and further into the ocean. I saw a flock of seagulls fly by the boat. I always like the part when I just go out into the ocean away from the mainland, because it makes me feel like I'm about to embark on a grand adventure. It always reminds me of The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker, a game that I played during my childhood. In the distance, I saw a pod of dolphins swimming together, and I even saw one of them jump out of the water. After about two hours, we came to a stop. The captain ordered us to get ready. Michael and I climbed into the submersible, and it lowered us into the water. We looked deep into the blue abyss as we descended from the surface. As we ventured through the depths, we saw many bizarre and wonderful things. There were colorful squids, jellyfish, and other diverse forms of undersea life. I operated in submersibles many times over the years, but this never gets old. When I first went into a submersible, I was scared that I might be attacked by a giant shark or something. But the more I operated submersibles, the more that fear faded away. Since sharks rarely attack humans, I guess there shouldn't be much to fear about them. We then came across a fish that I had never seen before. It was significantly larger than a whale shark, and it appeared to be 30 feet long. It had dark gray skin, a white underbelly, and had a giant gaping mouth. Wow, that thing's huge! Could that possibly be the lead sixes? said Michael. I thought those things were extinct since the Jurassic period. But there are creatures that we thought to have been extinct but are still alive, such as coelacanths. It was believed that they went extinct 400 million years ago, but they were discovered to be around in the Indian Ocean, I said. And we watched in awe as the gargantuan fish slowly swam and faded away. About seven minutes in, it began to get very dark in the water, so we activated the lights. As soon as we turned on the lights, we were greeted by a very large sperm whale. It made very loud clicks swimming around us out of curiosity. Michael moved one of the big humanoid arms of the submersible and gently touched the whale's nose. It frightened the whale and it swam away into the depths. A few minutes later, the whale returned and gazed at the robotic hand. I could tell that it was very curious about our submersible. Of all the years that I had operated these things, I had never seen a whale approach it in such a way. The animal could probably detect us inside using sonar. It turned to its side and then we saw its eyes as it looked inside the submersible. It both frightened and fascinated the two of us. After continuously circling around for several more minutes, it once again swam away. Shortly after, we finally reached the ocean floor. We saw a bizarre looking shark that I had never seen before. It looked remarkably like a thresher shark. All of its fins were not only long, but it was as if they were knives. This was an undiscovered species of a thresher shark. I gave it the name, Alopius cultro, or the knife thresher. 
Each shock was about 3 feet long and all the fins were the same length at about 6 feet in length. And I noticed that there were multiple knife threshers swimming together in a school. And this was remarkable because the only known shark that swims in schools are hammerheads. We ventured through the ocean floor for a while and then came across the ship that went missing. We went around it to examine what could have caused it to sink. And then what looked like enormous marks on the ship. They were anywhere from 10 to 80 feet long. Crap, what could have done this? I asked Michael who was equally as shocked as I was. Whatever did this must have been bigger than any known sea creature. It may even dwarf the blue whale. We continued to venture through the ocean floor and came across more and more ships. Most of them looked like World War I and World War II warships. They all had the same unnerving claw marks. Whatever did this must have been living in the same area for decades. Sinking any ship that slips into its territory, I said. Michael checked the submersible and realized that it was now time to resurface. Hold on. How are we going to prove to anybody what we saw? I asked. It's okay. There's a built-in camera in the submersible. I was quietly taking pictures the whole time, said Michael. I smiled at him. You're the best. As we headed to the surface and got picked up by the research boat, we showed them all the photos that Michael took. They were amazed by the discoveries that we made, but still did not know exactly what had caused the ships to sink. We sent our report to our boss, and a few days later, I received a voicemail from him. Hey there, I'm glad that you were able to find not only the wreckage of the ships, but also for discovering that new shark species, and that giant fish that was thought to have gone extinct. However, your work is not done yet. We still don't know what caused those ships to sink. You can theorize clover sinking the ships all you want, but we need to explore the bottom of the area more to see if there may be other possibilities as well as evidence. And next week, I want you and Michael to go down there again. This time, I want you two to stay longer in the wreckage and wait to see if something big arrives and see if there are maybe reefs that tore these ships apart as they sank. Take care. As I got up in the morning and drove my truck to the docks in that day, Michael greeted me there. You ready for round two? He asked. As we went deep into the ocean and dived once again in the Xiang, we made it to the bottom much faster than last time. We explored these sunken ships and searched to see if any reefs or pointy tall rocks may have caused anything. But aside from the ships, the ocean floor was completely flat. So, we followed our orders and waited to see if anything would happen. After an hour of nothing eventful, Michael got impatient and began to send us back up to the surface. But suddenly, I saw something that caught my attention. Michael, stop! He instantly stopped what he was doing and he looked at me. What? What's wrong? He asked. I then pointed at what I saw. There's a light in the distance. You see them coming closer. We both saw a light approaching from the darkness. The light was massive and bright. There appeared to be multiple lights moving closely towards us. We then heard a deafening howl. It sounded like a foghorn but at a much lower pitch. The sound was so loud that it had caused a violent vibration within the submersible. It terrified both of us, but we needed to see this thing. Sure enough, the creature arrived in our view, and it was not like anything we expected. It was a very grotesque fish that was at least 100 feet tall and 300 feet long. It had a giant gaping mouth, similar to basking sharks or the fish that we had encountered before. But rather than being made for eating plankton and krill, the leviathan had sets of long sharp teeth. It had three appendages on its head that served as the light sources similar to an anglerfish, and it had three eyes. This monstrosity must have been responsible for all the vanishing ships. The beast noticed our presence. It gave off another loud howl and slowly charged towards us. Our submersible was getting inhaled by the monster. I set the Xeon to full power and barely escaped from becoming food. We headed for the surface immediately, 
but the kaiju fish begin to chase us. All those legends of sea monsters and serpents attacking ships must have been true all along. I was so terrified and amazed by what was happening, but we had to escape this fish from hell. Suddenly, the two of us noticed schools of blade threshers heading towards the Leviathan. I turned the submersible around to see exactly what was happening, and we couldn't believe our eyes. The schools of sharks were using their blade-like fins to stab the giant and slash enormous cuts onto the beast. The monster emitted an agonizing roar as the sharks kept slashing at it with their now presumed razor-sharp fins and overwhelmed the giant. The sharks had tacted like a pig falling into a piranha-infested river. The water quickly turned red, attracting many other shark species as they all devoured the giant fish. It turns out that this giant was never responsible for the missing ships, but rather, those blade threshers must have attacked the boats with their sharp blades, causing them to sink, possibly mistaking the ships for a large animal such as a whale, like how sharks occasionally mistake humans as seals. As we made it towards the surface, we noticed our research boat sinking, and the surrounding waters were red.